Well, good morning, everyone. And uh, my name is Sally Aiken. I'm a professor and associate dean of research and innovation in the Faculty of Forestry at UBC. And I'm very pleased you've been able to join us this morning. So I'd like to start off by acknowledging that UBC's Point Grey campus is situated on the traditional ancestral and unceded territory of the Musqueam people. But I also know we have attendees joining today from across BC, across Canada, and elsewhere in the world, uh, near and far, and, and in many areas with uh, different traditional owners and caretakers of those lands. So on behalf of the Faculty of Forestry, I'd, I'd like to extend a warm welcome to all of you. And it's really uh, great to be able to bring everyone together from so many different places during these unprecedented times and uh, share this webinar uh, and spend some time together. So we're grateful to have you with us. So uh, a little bit of housekeeping before we get started. If you have any trouble with the audio or video issues, please reach out uh, using the live chat feature in the GoToWebinar assistance on, on this program and someone will help you right away. So let's get started with today's uh, seminar then. So the field of forest operations in Canada has changed very rapidly and continues to change. And the dis discipline is really evolving uh, in new directions. Forest operations have become a bridge among a lot of different land use and forest management objectives with uh, goals ranging from reducing carbon emissions to reducing risks of catastrophic wildfires to making forest harvesting uh, safer uh, for those people working out in the woods. And all of these activities support more sustainable forestry practices. So today's presentation will pro provide a vision of forest operations for the future and feature uh, highlights from current research that is ongoing at UBC. We're going to learn about topics ranging from the use of virtual reality in operational planning to uh, managing biomass fuel supplies for small scale heat and power installations. And we're really fortunate to have Dr. Dominic Roser uh, who's an associate professor in forest operations in the Faculty of Forestry at UBC here with us today. Dominic is the program director for the forest operations undergraduate program and over the past two years while he's been with us at UBC he's built a forest operations research program that focuses on many things we'll hear about today including supply chain uh, design, forest technology implementation, um, harvesting on steep slopes and uh, biomass operations. Before Dominic started at UBC in 2018, he worked as senior director at FP Innovations, managing a multidisciplinary team that focused on improving competitiveness in the forest sector and also developing practical solutions to improve efficiency of forest operations. He's got more than 17 years of experience in forest research and innovation in both Europe and Canada. So before we get to Dominic, I would like to uh, introduce Slido, the, um, the tool that you'll be using to ask questions today. So don't use the chat box on the GoToWebinar, but instead use the Slido app. And all you have to do is use your smartphone uh, or another browser to go to slido.com and you'll enter the code hashtag UBC forestry, all small letters. That will allow you to ask questions or to vote for questions that other people have asked. And then I in turn will relay the top questions to Dominic. So we're expecting a presentation of about uh, half an hour and then we'll have lots of time for discussion. So with that, um, I'd like to turn things over to Dominic. So Dominic, uh, take it away. Thank you very much, Sally. Uh, welcome everyone. I'm very pleased to, to see uh, so many people attending and uh, interested in, uh, in forest operations. And uh, so we'll, we'll, get, we'll get started right away. Um, as as uh, Sally mentioned, I, I have. Um, only been at UBC for for a couple of years, still getting used to 
what academia is like and um, all of the, the benefits and, and challenges that uh, come with this. But I, I'm really excited to, um, to be building this new forest operations program at UBC um, because I think it is such an important field. It has, uh, as you will learn today, so many different applications for, for everybody that is working in forestry, whether it is in conservation, whether it is in, in wildfire management, or whether it is um, actually in, in, uh, in the operations piece, forest management piece. But um, the, the, the title, Building Bridges, I, I think is, uh, is really representative of this. I, I, I think in the past, um, the, 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 the discipline of uh, forest operations or forest engineering um, and was really focused on, on building bridges, uh, um, building roads and, and cutting trees as efficiently as possible. But I really see that evolving and, and uh, some of the projects that I'll be talking about today um, will touch on those, those areas that um, we, we are already covering and, and maybe some, a bit of a vision as to where we want to head in the future. Um, so the, the vision that I kind of developed for, or that, that I see for our research program is, is to become this holistic solution provider um, that enables sustainable forest management with very little uh, impact on the environment and climate. Um, I, I have uh, some of this idea of this statement is, is coming from our Swedish colleagues and uh, they actually have with uh, no impact on the environment and climate. Uh, but um, I think that is very ambitious. Um, I, I think, however, though, Whenever we do something in the forest, we have an impact on the environment and climate, but we try to make that as little as possible or as positive of, uh, as possible, of course, moving forward. Um, you, you know, as, as uh, Sally mentioned, uh, forest operations have come a long way. Um, in the pictures uh, that you see here on the top uh, left corner is, is an old logging operation in BC. And in the in the bottom picture is a uh, a picture of uh, the first um, platooning um, uh, trial that uh, was carried out in in Quebec um, last year. So you know there is even though the the basic principles are all still the same, we're trying to move logs from one place to another. The way we do that has changed significantly, and. I think in BC, I, I, for full disclosure, I am originally from, from Germany. Um, I've been in BC for since 2012, so almost eight years now. Um, I've learned a lot about uh, BC, um, but I, I, what I have learned is that there is a bit of a difficult relationship with forest operations. I, I think often it is seen as the, the people cutting down trees and, and paying very little respect to environmental concerns or social concerns. Um, and, and that is really the mantra I, I have been trying to change and I'm, I'm working very hard um, to change in the, in the future because I think our, as I, I will talk about now, our field really has the opportunity and, and all the necessary tools to support all the, the different values that uh, forestry has across the, the landscape in our communities. Um, and and that, is the, that has really been the goal of trying to set up this, this program. I think also what I have learned uh, being in BC for, for eight years is that we have no shortage of uh, challenges, um, you know, ranging from mountain pine beetle, now spruce beetle in the, in the Eastern Canada, the spruce buttworm. We've been dealing with fires. We've been dealing with many issues around social license uh, of uh, forest, forestry, forest management. Um, the tenure diversification is, is bringing up new, new challenges. Uh, we have lots of uh, wildlife concerns around habitat uh, creation, caribous, uh, mule deer winter range, uh, goshawk, um, and, and then of course the, the, the overall um, underlying challenge that we have to deal with uh, around climate change and, and forest carbon management. And 
again, I, I see um, operations as, as, as one unifying piece in, in all of those. Um, because I think we have all the toolbox, uh, tools in the toolbox um, to support all of these challenges and, and associated disciplines, uh, stakeholders uh, with that. With, so, you know, low, low impact technology solutions. Um, so harvesting, uh, treating stands, um, habitat creation with as little impact as possible. Looking at different treatment options, how do we organize our operations different in the future to, to have or to touch on more of these different values that we have in the, in the forest and on our land base? What are some of the innovative technology approaches that we can use to get there? What are the right supply chains, uh, concepts that, that we can uh, develop? And, and I think moving forward, this IT um, solutions and use of big data and new technologies will become more and more prevalent. Um, again, I think in, in, uh, that in BC, I, I find we're sometimes hesitant to, to adopt uh, new technologies and new solutions, but um, there is very um, many opportunities that we're currently not taking care of uh, or not taking advantage of that they're using in other jurisdictions uh, already, and that will help us to become more competitive. And so, you know, looking at the, the graph there, I, I see operations as kind of the hub that touches on all these different areas um, that are mentioned there, ranging from hydrology to conservation to wildlife policy, um, First Nations forestry, community forests, um, and, and, and wildfire. And, and I'll talk a little bit more now as to how I see that um, evolving. So now that you have the vision, I, I also wanted to use the the opportunity to um, kind of get everybody up to date what's happening in the forest operations undergraduate program. Um, you know, I think based on some of the challenges that that I mentioned earlier, um, and it seems that our youth today is more drawn to uh, conservation and um, science issues, I, I think we have to do a better job of actually marketing what um, what forest operations does and, and how it links to those other disciplines. So that's again where for me the bridge building comes in. So what uh, we've done over, over the last two years, uh, and, and this is an ongoing process, is really looking at the curriculum, modernize the um, the curriculum that we, we have in forest operations. Um, I think it is our job at the university and academia to lead um, industry, to lead um, the sector with new technologies. So that's, I think, is something that I'm looking um, to, to um, better integrate into our teaching um, and, and actually have the ability to test new technologies. And, and so that gives uh, give, giving industry a bit of a head start and then much more focus on experiential learning and, and multidisciplinary approaches in, in how we address projects. So we've had a very successful project um, with the Revelstoke Community Forest this last fall where we took a, a group of students there twice, once to collect data and, and look at the project and then to actually present the project um, to the, the, the local foresters. And I think it was very well received by all sides. We have also started a, a collaboration uh, with EGBC where we have now an agreed course list um, that allows uh, forestry students to achieve uh, both their RPF and PNG designations. It will mean that they have to take an extra year of courses um, at, uh, at UBC. Um, but it then gives them, I think, a much broader um, opportunities and, and uh, work in different uh, sectors, and which is also, I think, in, in line where some of the policy is, is going um, around professional organizations. And, and I've had quite a bit of interest from, from students to, um, to kind of work in that field and, and uh, looking to, to take this new um, avenue um, uh, that uh, for for our undergraduate students, we haven't done, promoted it very well yet, as we're still trying to iron out some of the challenges that would pose. But um, I think it's it's another exciting opportunity that we're currently working on. 
So some of the knowledge gaps and some of the challenges that we are faced with is that I think we, we, we're we seeing a lot of climate change impact on forest operations. We have shorter um, operational seasons. Uh, we have uh, spring break up at different times, um, uh, usually earlier. Um, the, the ground is freezing later into winter. We see more uh, challenges due to fire seasons being longer, and that actually um, is shortening the the number of days where we can operate in the forest, putting even more pressure on those operations when we are there. And and one of the keys, I think, is to find solutions on how we address that and how we uh, future proof our operations um, moving forward. The other one that that it keeps coming up is really around more intensive uh, silviculture um, and uh, the multiple objectives associated with that. So pre-commercial thinnings, thinnings, um, how we deal with habitat and visual areas, and and as we address some of those challenges, it will mean bringing in new technology. So cut CTL stands for cut to length technology. That's the, the the more of the European system where we have much smaller stand sizes um, and and smaller operations. Here in, in in BC in Canada, we are more focusing on tree length operations. Um, I think we're the best in the world at tree length operation here in BC, um, whereas in Europe, I think they're the best in the world in in cut to length. And, and I think there's a real opportunity to learn from each other and, and have some mutual benefits. And, and I think that will create many more opportunities for here in BC. We, we need uh, better um, efficiency in our operations uh, and, and having them as, as, with lo as low impact as, as possible. And, and so I'll be talking about that a little bit later in terms of how some of the cable work that we're working on. Um, the residue utilization, again, is a big challenge here in BC, uh, where I think everybody is looking for solutions to minimize, minimize the amount of harvest residues that are left after um, operations and, and finding better uses for them. And then as in regards to the, the different uh, tenure um, challenges, um, I think there's big opportunities there. Uh, not sorry, the tenure diversification, there's opportunities there moving to smaller, uh, low impact operations um, and of course these have very different um, overall objectives and I think there's an opportunity to um, to work more in those integrating operations as much as we can in order to achieve more common benefits so I'll, I'll run fairly quickly now through a, a series of some of the projects that uh, I'm working on with uh, some of my students um, the first one is the forest machine connectivity uh, project um, that is addressing this, this challenge that we have today with big data um, that we're not really taking advantage of. We have the forest machine as the hub um, in the forest at all times. And I think we're not really taking advantage of all these machines can collect about um, the the fleet that the labor management the description of standing trees as it is as it is harvesting for example description of the terrain the local environment um, and then of course planning the logistics and wood flow so we're constantly collecting data being out in the forest um, but right now we're we're not really using that to our advantage and I think that's um, where we want to moving forward is is having um, that connectivity in the field and and so the the, the uh, Canada's innovation supercluster um, initiative is is a very large federal government um, initiative and so we've started a project with uh, Canfor, um, Timber West, now Mosaic Forest Products, Slim Geomatics uh, and FP Innovations um, to address these challenges and come up with solutions on how we better manage uh, big data along the supply chain in order to improve our um, decision making. So I'm very excited about this opportunity uh, moving forward because I think it will provide a lot of these insights into the supply chain that we have in Europe but we that we currently not have in, in, uh, in tree length operations where for example in the picture you're seeing on the top right corner 
we we don't even have the ability to measure how many trees we're we're cutting in a day. So we're, th those are the kind of solutions we 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 want to work on moving forward. Another one is uh, this supply chain uh, management, and so looking uh, trying to optimize where the fiber is, mapping it out, and and working on the logistics and and carbon performance of different supply chains. So that's a project we're working on with uh, with Trimble and Torchlight Bioresources to find um, uh, solutions to um, provide more real-time feedback for supply chain managers and then be able to have a much better idea how we measure carbon along the supply chain and be able to weigh uh, different technology solutions against each other and making sure that we limit the amount of carbon um, emitted through those um, operations. And then the other very important aspect here is that we're trying to create transparency for consumers. And I think we have done a much better job in managing the, the larger supply chain, but uh, when we really come from the forest, looking at the forest supply chain, I think there's an, an opportunity moving forward. The next one is really focusing on improving our forest management practices. And, and I know uh, a lot of the foresters that have been working in BC for a long time, they're probably rolling their eyes right now that we're talking about uh, commercial thinnings again, or, or thinnings in general. Um, but I think given the fiber shortages, uh, this is one way um, how we can address um, these shortages moving forward is, is addressing uh, finding suitable stands um, that that are available now and building uh, a new um, a new database of stands uh, moving moving forward meaning we need to start planting at, at the right densities to um, create more of these opportunities um, in the future so that is something we're, we're currently um, you know, working on identifying these stands and um, Looking at some of the other benefits as well, uh, fuel treatments, um, better resiliency to coming pests, um, and then of course looking at overall reducing greenhouse gas emissions uh, through the reduced uh, burning of um, of harvest residues. Um, you know some of the benefits we we have been identified that I just went uh, went through um, better distribution of harvest. Um, I think managing the production of, of mixed stands uh, are just a couple ones um, that that I think stand uh, stand out. But then also this, especially the the wildfire hazard and and using fuel treatments, um, you know, in order to create some fiber supply as well in the in the future. And um, so. I, I think we are on the on on a good path uh, there. I think there's uh, plenty of opportunities, but I think the biggest challenge is identifying what are the stands now. Um, if you look at the cost comparison here between Europe and some of the trials that have been done in BC, I think we're all in the same ballpark with an opportunity to reduce costs in the future even even further. But what it really will need is is a vision, um, you know, as as a, from from a provincial uh, perspective, from the the forest industry perspective, and from all the other stakeholders involved. Is how do we make this sustainable in the long run? And I think the the, the key missing pieces there that we are starting to work on is is how do we um, improve training? Um, how do we improve operator training? Having the right equipment in place and and being able to to develop methods um, how do we approach these stands what is the the right um, uh, technology in the right conditions and so we have a couple of bigger initiatives uh, underway there's a, a a national project looking at to improve silvicultural practices called Silva 21 that's uh, su supposed to be submitted by the end of this month it's a collaboration um, between different universities um, led by Laval um, but here at UBC we, we play a fairly big role in that as well together with um, a lot of my colleagues and uh, then uh, the city of Quenelle is is very active with their uh, forestry initiatives program and in trying to um, change the, the the future of the the community and the surrounding forests, um, and so we're, we're we're planning some work there as well in in 
uh, optimizing operator training um, and uh, and trying to develop new tools and methods that um, we can work together. And I think the, the really big opportunity is that this is a, an, another leg for contractors moving forward to ensure sustainability. I think this, if done properly and, and with the right people on board, can really create a new type of business um, for our economies, uh, for our forest economy moving forward, ensuring fiber supply, contributing to more contractor sustainability, and um, and and really creating a new arm of, uh, of forestry moving forward. The next project um, that uh, I, I just wanted to touch on was um, reducing the emissions from post-harvest residue pro uh, from post-harvest residues. This is a collaborative effort between the ministry, um, the the CFS, and um, and UBC. Um, we've been trying to track. Um, uh, the the use of uh, harvest residues. Um, I think there's still some challenges around estimating the the exact um, volumes. Uh, so I have an, a, a master student that's working on this um, and and trying to really capture the state of the knowledge. Where where are we at? What do we know? What do we not know? And then be able to to make some recommendations moving forward on how we can address these challenges and, and how do we tie the growing bioeconomy in the province together um, with this, this opportunity that's currently uh, currently being burned and that should have a much better home um, moving forward. And tying right into that is the, the community bioenergy um, uh, project that, that I am involved in together with my team. And, and so this is uh, trying to establish combined heat and power for remote communities, uh, mostly to get communities off diesel generation. And so we have a, a testing facility that we've established here on, on campus. There's a few snapshots. Uh, you can see a, a, a wood drying facility there in the, in the middle. Um, so this is actually allows to dry wood chips to a moisture content of 10, 11 percent, uh, and then being burned in a combined heat and power. So this this container that you see there and has a, a Finnish uh, CHP system in it that is able to make heat and electricity at the same time, all being powered by by wood chips. And and the, the vision there is really to um, to use local resources from around the community, um, from fuel treatments ideally, um, uh, and then use that local material to produce energy um, and, and not having to fly in or, or ship in diesel from other um, jurisdictions. So I have a PhD student that's currently working on techno-economic analysis um, on how that can work um, and, and making sure that um, uh, we 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 have proper technology adoption from uh, in this case um, uh, Finland, and uh, and also making sure that we develop a sustainable training program that uh, once the the unit actually goes out into a community, um, that everybody is trained, everybody knows how to to run the system, and and being able to ensure um, success not only in the short term but in the in the long term. And so as part of that, we've also been exploring um, the use of much smaller equipment than we're used to here in, in BC. Um, we always say everything's bigger in North America, and that's definitely the, the case when we're talking about forest operations. Um, so again, we, we are the best at using grinders that have a thousand horsepower, um, but we lack some of the experience and knowledge when it comes to some of these really small chipping operations um, that you see here where you have 35 horsepower tractors. And so we've purchased uh, one of those chippers, the one on the, on the right, uh, to do some trials uh, in communities. Um, we've done the first trial in, uh, uh, in Edmonton uh, last summer. Now, COVID has kind of put the second trial on hold that we wanted to do in our research forest here. But uh, it's a very exciting project because I think these technologies do provide a community level um, 
solutions. Um, we have a couple of community forests in BC that are working with these kind of technologies um, already, I think quite successfully. And I think moving forward, that kind of ties back into the commercial thinning piece as well. It's finding the right technology to create a new niche um, for solutions that we're currently not, um, not very well used to. And you know that ties into the whole wildfire fuel treatment questions because I think we've gotten so accustomed to pay very high prices for for fuel treatments. You know anywhere from 5,000 per hectare to I've heard 30,000 per hectare. The, the the average is probably somewhere in the middle, but um, I think bringing in the suitable technologies, these small scale technologies from different uh, places where they have been proven, we know they work, um, provides another opportunity to reduce those costs. And I want to be clear, it's not just about reducing costs, but it's about treating more area moving forward. So keeping the same people employed, but treating double the size uh, of, uh, of area that, that we are currently uh, treating. Uh, we've also been involved. I have a, um, a postdoc student that's working on, on steep slope safety, mostly with cable um, monitoring systems. So we've done a couple of studies now in, in uh, actually in, in, uh, in Washington um, with, uh, with Wirehauser there, looking at the different uh, cable tension um, effects and, and how working methods affect uh, cable tension. We found out some some really int interesting information as to how we can move uh, cap uh, which operational um, aspects um, have the biggest effect on on cable tension. Um, you know what do we need to avoid in the future to to ensure longevity of our of our cables? Um, what are the work elements that have the biggest effects there? So. Um, there's some some really interesting results coming uh, out of that that we're planning to to publish and working with industry players to ensure that all this that we're staying within the safety limits and making sure that this technology that can have um, whether it is winch assist harvesting systems or or cable systems making sure that we're staying within the right uh, limitations and uh, ensuring that these systems work. And, and ensuring, of course, that the, the safety of everybody involved. Um, and then, so this is another uh, quick study we, we have done to compare how, um, actually it wasn't very quick, but it, it was a, a very interesting study where we compared uh, some of the tools uh, that are available for, for planning cable operations with actual uh, field uh, data. And as you can see here, um, the blue and the red line is so one. The, I think the red one is the prediction um, of the, the computer software, and the, the the blue line is what we found in the in the in our research doing actual field trials, and they match up uh, very uh, very well. Very proud to say that my postdoc student for for this work received uh, a, a an award at uh, one of the biggest forest operations uh, conferences that uh, that we had uh, or that we have uh, back in, in in October so uh it's been really really good and uh, and interesting work um i'm starting to run out of time so i another project i wanted to run through quick was the the, the virtual reality uh project that we're working on and and trying to find these new technologies and how they can help us in operational uh, planning. We are starting to collect more and more data in forestry, but I think we haven't really um, found a good way to use all of that data. And so this VR work that we've been involved in is really one way of, of trying to find new tools to better visualize that data and provide planners uh, better insights into what's going on um, in the forest. There's different types of tools that are available out there. Uh, there's augmented reality, that's kind of your Pokemon game where you have additional things on your phone that help you in decision making. And then you have um, virtual reality, that's um, where you have the headset on and you're fully immersed in the, into the technology. So we've kind of played around with um, uh, a couple of them. 
we came to the conclusion that the the um the virtual reality in in this case works better and i i just have a few slides um, of some of the the first projects uh, we've been working on so this is a joint again a joint project that we've started with uh, with fp innovations um llama zoo is the the software development company based out of victoria um that started uh, in in the mining business and then we the data set that you see now has been from a, a site on Vancouver Island from Interpor. Um, and so this was kind of the first proof of concept to see here, you can see in the darker green in the middle is the, the area that we've been working on. And the objective was to visualize individual trees, canopy heights, topography, slope, and, and the different uh, tree species. So here you can see what, um, what that looks like in, in reality so you can actually fly in and out of different uh, places you can go for a walk in the in the forest and and see what the terrain is like you can visualize where the different roads and harvesting blocks are located you can plan new roads um, as you as you um, move along as you use the the software you can then remove as you see here the the trees um, from that road you can go walk it and so that we see brings lots of benefits um, for from an operational perspective and how we can improve our decision making uh, moving forward here's uh, the different uh, slopes that are over 120 percent again from a road planning perspective um, creeks crossings um, culverts all all that kind of uh, work um, you know, it should be made easier um, through those tools. And here you can see different uh, different functions that you can see. We've been working on a, an ArcGIS uh, and and road engine integration. See how how that could um, how that could work. And then, as I said, you can actually go for a walk through the forest. And it has been a very successful story uh, with our students that have really enjoyed this work. Some of them had me asking if they have that's this, these kind of tools when they start the job, and and I'd say, well, not not yet, but hopefully, um, hopefully in the future. Um, I think this is also a very great tool for stakeholder engagement and and planning of operations um, and and getting multiple stakeholders on the table, showing them what it will look like before and after. So you can remove trees from different uh, stands and, and show the effect. Um, and of, I think that's a very powerful tool in terms of engagement of different uh, stakeholders across the board. We've also done a cost benefit um, analysis. Uh, I think the biggest uh, part in this having less helicopter time um, and, and making more decisions from the office uh, without having to actually go out um, into, into the forest. And, and I think the different use cases um, you know, that, that we have listed here is visual quality assessments, um, great guidance as you're planning uh, to put in a road, um, deflection calculations, uh, distance measurements, and uh, you know, being, I think the biggest one is really being able to visualize different data sets at the same time. And I think the key here is that we, are, we, we still don't have all the solutions. We're working on the best use cases and trying to identify what is really the best use case of this moving forward. The first proof of concept was 5,000 hectares. I'm really happy to say with some, some support from some of our donors, we've also been able to uh, get our research forest, the Malcolm Knapp Research Forest, into the system yet. And, um, and so there's just a couple of uh, pictures on now that's 5,000 hectares. And uh, the next stage hopefully then is, is moving to you know, much larger sizes, 50 to, to 100,000 um, hectares. So I want to end, I have uh, I think one more minute before we go to questions, is where we meet, need to move moving forward. And, and here in this graph, you see the development of our productivity increase. We've always been able to increase productivity in our forest operations. Uh, through mechanization and rationalization. But you can see here since the year 2000, that curve has flattened and, and we're moving in the other direction. And I think that is due, this is a picture from Sweden, but I think it holds true for us as well here in BC, is the, the fact that we have to take in 
and that we are uh, doing a much better job in, in considering different values um, and having to take take into account uh, uh, different stakeholder um, views and opinions and, and planning purposes, uh, etc. So I think this coming back to this picture there is a very big opportunity moving forward um and and i've already said before that i think the the hub is the forest machine but i'm actually going to go back on my word and and ask the question so where's the real hub in this picture and and if going going back to 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 here this has been achieved through better technology and i think moving forward we need to focus on the operator um, this is, of course, not a proper operator. That's me sitting in a machine. Um, but I think that is the opportunity moving forward. And why I'm saying this is that um, in, in Sweden recently has been a study that uh, has shown that with proper, uh, that the oper operator has such a big effect on, on operations that it, it productivity of the ver machine very, can vary by, by up to 50%. So we can achieve much higher productivity, not by changing the technology, but by changing the operator or by properly training the operator. So I think what, what needs to be done in the future to improve our operations and to kind of go back on an on a increasing trajectory on that, that uh, curve that I just showed a, a couple minutes ago is focusing on how we can support the operator. Um, that is going back to traditional um, work study, work science, studying the operator, what he's doing well, why a good operator is doing, what a good operator is doing different from an average operator and how we can help the average operator to, to achieve that same level. How, do we, how can we assist the operator through heads up displays, for example? Um, how can we provide the operator feedback feedback as he's working. Um, you know, you're doing, you're moving too close to a tree every time you're harvesting. Um, and semi-automation, and I just want to show a very interesting graph here. This is, uh, uh, again, from a study that was done in Sweden. In the top, uh, the 98% was um, a forwarder operator loading logs. And the same operator had some automation integrated in, in the, into his operations, so where he just had to press a button and the, the forwarder was moving the logs automatically onto the forwarder. And you can see that there was almost a 50% reduction in, in actual thinking that the operator has to do. So I think that is really the, the opportunity uh, moving forward. Um, it, focusing on, on operator training, um, game theories, uh, lots of young kids are very good at computer games. In the picture here, this is a forwarder that is actually being um, operated from an Xbox controller in, in, again in, in Sweden. So I think that's the opportunity moving forward. And I want to end on, on this picture. This is the, the Forest Machine Learning Lighthouse. It's a, a facility in Finland uh, for operator training. Um, all of these machines that you can see there are uh, stationary, electric powered, and the trainers are sitting in on the top of the, the, the tower on the lighthouse and, and being able to um, give fe live feedback to operators as they're training um, and learning um, on the job what they're doing. I think that's our opportunity. That's the vision we should strive for. I think we can significantly improve our operations, not necessarily by only bringing in new technology, but making sure we train our operators properly moving forward. So with that, um, I think uh, we're, we, we can go to some questions now. I'm happy to, to hear um, what you have to say. And again, just a reminder to use Slido for your questions that Sally will now moderate. Thank yeah. you. So thanks very much, Dominic. Uh, it was a really interesting presentation and you've covered a lot of ground. Uh, we have 47 questions, so we're not going to get to all of them, uh, but all kinds of interesting topics are covered here. So I'm going to uh, go in order of uh, the audience uh, popularity of the question, if you will. So the first question is, in your view, is biomass when burned to produce energy carbon neutral? <laughs> um, the, well, it, I think the, the proper 
answer to this is it depends, right? It, it is what is being replaced, um, what what kind of biomass is being used um, in for for producing the the energy, um, and so it 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 is never um, carbon neutral. Uh, I would say it is carbon lean because we we are emitting some fossil fuel along the supply chain. Um, it it can be um, it, it can be positive if if done uh, correctly, and uh, if if not done correctly, it can all, also have adverse effects um, to to what we're trying to achieve um, with uh, with our climate targets. So, I don't think there's a straight yes or no answer to this, um, and and I think it it really is true. It will depend on the op the, the the type of material, the type of fossil fuel that's being replaced and the type of overall operations that we're choosing. Thank you for that. Uh, we have uh, some of our students on the line and, and uh, they'll know that the answer of many professors to questions is, it depends. <laughs> yes. In so many circumstances. Uh, but very complex work in carbon modeling is, is certainly an incredibly important field uh, in forestry these days. Uh, so the next question is, uh, how are you connecting with First Nations? Um, I think there there's many different uh, different ways. So um, we've had lots of, and this is uh, partly due to my um, my previous um, connection to to FP Innovations, where we we had a First Nations technical support program in place. And, and through that, we've had many different interactions um, with First Nations, especially on, on these small, um, small scale uh, technology solutions that I, I showed you in, those, uh, in the slides earlier. Um, it, it's trying to find local solutions that create employment, um, that create uh, energy independence, and that uh, support fireproofing around communities. So I think that's been my my biggest um, interaction um, uh, with First Nations. We've had lots and lots of interest um, about uh, community bioenergy, um, combined heat and power. Um, so the project I was alluding to, we have a First Nation uh, that is actually involved, that is uh, buying this unit that wants to um, eventually um, use our chipper um, as well, um, and uh, and so from from again from my perspective that's been um, a, a big interaction, um, and then of course the the uh, fuel um, fuel mitigation um, around community has been another, trying to find ways on how we can use smaller scale technologies that are mostly used in in Europe in in these kind of uh, situations where you know machines don't have to run um, eight hours a day um, it's much cheaper equipment it doesn't have to run all the time and kind of trying to create solutions um, that way um, for for communities so I think there's there's been lots um, lots of interest into the the kind of work that that we're doing. Um, together with FP Innovations um, on especially these smaller scale technologies and, and solutions. Thanks for that. Uh, very, in, very important work for, uh, for uh, many of our remote communities and, and communities in fire prone places. Uh, so the next question that uh, lots of people are interested in is a wide open one and that is what technological advances in forestry are you most excited about? I, I think it's really around the the the, the abilities um, to as, as I ended here I, I'm most excited about how we can support operators and it, that is very much linked to um, to do to big data and and having new types of technologies available to us today um, and that we're currently not really employing very well in forestry in general. I think other sectors are are way ahead. They have it a bit easier if you compare it to, for example, to mining, where you're very stationary. In forestry, we're moving around, we're working in, in very cold temperatures, and, and so I think there's challenges around that. 
we don't have satellite communication, uh, sorry, um, cell phone communication everywhere. Again, that's something that the Europeans have. Um, so I, I'm really most excited about on how we can improve the life for our operators and forestry workers. Instead of sitting on a machine, I think in the future they will sit in a container um, on, on the side of the road um, and working together rather than sitting on the machine by themselves, they'll be sitting in a container uh, together being able to have social interactions. That is all made possible through new technologies. As soon as we have 5G, I think that will be something that, that's happening very fast. Um, heads up displays, helping them to make decisions, trying to reduce the, the mental load by automating some of the processes moving forward. So I think these, all of these technolo technological advances that we're seeing in other sectors, I think will eventually trickle down in the forest sector. And I'm really excited um, because as I said, I think we have reached our limit when it comes to improving op operations by technology. And the next uh, era, I think, will be in improving the life of the operators and the managers and, and essentially all of us, that we will have the tools available to us to make better decisions from an environmental, a social and operational perspective. Very interesting. Um, and uh, it will be interesting to see uh, the kinds of changes we've seen in, for example, in agriculture, uh, moving moving into the forest in terms of all the information, all the data that operators have at hand and, and all the automation. Um, so uh, a couple of uh, perhaps related questions. Um, the first one is what is the role of remote sensing and satellite imagery in the future of sustainable forest management? And another one is uh, relates to the use of drones in forest management and what kind of role they could play in the future. I I, I think they will play. They are already playing a very a very big role. And I think the biggest uh, role for them in the future is going to be again. I I I keep saying that, but improving our decision making. Um, we we always look to to Europe um, uh, or as, as Sweden Finland um, as our biggest competitors and and I think we have to realize that they have very good information because they are in a much smaller area and it's much easier to use these technologies like drones the uh, uh, like remote sensing uh, lidar for example just to mention one and I think we need to move in the same direction we need to use these tools. Uh, in order to have much better information what's out there uh, to be able to do planning for multiple values um, on the land base. Um, I think that's going to be um, a, a big game changer um, moving forward because I think we, the better information we have, the better decisions we can make. And, and I think remote sensing and drones will play uh, very important roles in getting us there and and I think that's um, we are still trying to figure out where those niches are where each where remote sensing will work and where drones will work and because I think they're none of them are the the savior for everything uh, we we have to find the the operational niches for those tools and start using them much more effectively I was shocked when I was in New Zealand um, uh, two years ago at a, at a forest operations conference. Um, we had been talking about drones in, in, in forestry as from a research perspective uh, when I was working at FP Innovations at that time. And then we come to New Zealand and here almost every forester has a drone in their car and they, they use it as just another tool in the toolbox. That's where we need to get to in, in BC as well, is using those tools when we have the right application to, to improve our decision-making and to make our uh, operations overall much more um, efficient. And given the topic of remote sensing, I'd just like to give a shout out to Dr. Nicholas Koops, who is a colleague of ours and who has won this year's Wallenberg Prize from Sweden, with, uh, which is uh, considered the, sometimes called the Nobel in forestry. 
and his work on remote sensing uh, and modeling is is uh, really interesting. We're hoping we might be able to get him for a future uh, webinar. So a very tough question, and this is probably the last one we have time for. How important is tenure reform and diversification to support sustainable forest management in BC? <laughs> um, uh, of course, that that is a very um, a very difficult question, and, and I will answer it. Uh, and uh, of course, it is very political, uh, but I will answer it from my perspective, uh, and that is what I have seen in. Um, in community forests, in, in some of the First Nation forestry um, work that I have been involved in, is has been really encouraging to see. And and so um, I think a lot of the new tools and technologies um, can be adopted or can be trialed in those kind of uh, um, scenarios because there there's different objectives. A community forest, I think, has a little bit different objective um than than a major licensee holder and so i i i have seen um the development of uh, what what's happening in community forests from an operational perspective very interesting because i i think that's where we have been able to to test new things that's where a lot of the interest in the, uh, the new technologies are coming from uh, because they want to do things differently they have multiple values uh, that they have to manage for um, from mountain bike trails to um, hiking trails to um, cultural areas, and and uh, harvesting or or you know selling logs in order to be profitable and and so I think that's been um, very very important um, and I think the other really important piece that I that I find is that in in comparison to my experience in in Finland and Sweden, where 70% of the forest is owned privately by private forest owners. And it changes the viewpoint. Um, every forest owner has an interest to maintain his forest for not only for himself, but for future generations, and to have some income from it as well, um, and to be able to pick mushrooms and berries and, and be out and, and have um, so I, I think there's a very different relationship to the forest, which I think is very positive, um, but it comes with its own set of challenges. But I think, um, you know, tenure reform, I, I, it, it's been discussed so much. Um, I think there, there is probably a need to, to, reform, um, to, to reform the tenure, but I, I think we also have to be uh, very cognizant that it doesn't solve anything. We have some underlying challenges that that we we need to solve as a as a forestry discipline. Um, um, but I, from what I've seen, and I'm I'm happy to have uh, you know follow up conversations with uh, with anyone that's interested. The from you know this this having a stake in in uh, in the forest um, from from private forest owner is is very different. A very different experience from what I've experienced here, and I think there's some learnings there um, that um, we can probably adapt in our discussions uh, around tenure reform moving forward. Okay, well, with that, uh, I'd like to thank you very much, Dominic. That has it's been such an interesting presentation. There's been a huge amount of interest. Thanks to the 175 participants who joined online today. Uh, great audience and, and great questions. And uh, thanks to all of you, uh, whether you're a Faculty of Forestry student, one of our alumni, or a friend of the faculty, uh, thanks for joining in today. And uh, I hope that all of you uh, stay safe, stay home, and stay healthy. And I hope you can get outside and, and see a, a forest or, or at least a tree uh, in the near future. So have a great rest of your day, and thanks for joining us. <laughs>